Hi, what's your name? How old are you? And uh, what do you do? Hi, everybody. I'm Soraya. I am 10 years old, and I go to school for my work. And can you explain what you were learning about recently? I was learning about the concept of <laughs> of entrepreneurship. What is an entrepreneur, you goof? A entrepreneur is, can be many things. For example, it can be a product or a business. You're an entrepreneur, but my father isn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have my own business, but your dad works for a company. That's true, Manish. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you calling me by my first name? Because that's what they do on podcasts. Okay, so to become an entrepreneur, sometimes you need someone to invest in you, right? That's true. <laughs> what does that mean? Invest means to give money for the start and for the business itself mm-hmm. if they have an office like you do. Mm-hmm. Just so to any of the hiccups. So one of the things we're going to talk about in this episode is there are some entrepreneurs like women or black people who don't get as much money or investment to start their companies. So they have trouble starting their companies. Why do you think that is? I think that is because they weren't treated like white men. So they weren't treated as fairly and given as much opportunity? Yes, indeed. What do you think of that? I think it is totally unfair. Agreed. Now, Agreed. Got anything else you want to add? Why do avocados have pits? Such a good question. That'll have to be a future episode. Of course. From the mouths of babes, folks, I'm Anoush Zamarodi, and this is ZigZag, the business podcast about being human. And if my daughter decides to become an entrepreneur, I will invest in her. I will introduce her to everyone I know because we need more women founders. But also, you know, because I can. I mean, I'm lucky. And that's how business usually works, right? It's who you know, where you come from. But what if you don't have that kind of support network? Well, you start at a disadvantage. It's something listener Gail has been struggling with. Once you have this great idea and this thing that you really are passionate about and you really care about, how do you actually make that happen? How do you actually take that idea and realize it? Because I don't have anyone, honestly, I don't have anyone who can help me with that. And if I don't even have a way to formulate a real plan, then I don't have a way to go to people and say, I need help with money. I need, you know, startup capital. I need someone to invest in me. And so that's where I'm stuck. Oh, Gail, I feel you. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Let's start with the good news. The good news is that women have been getting more investment money to start companies. Last year, $3.3 billion of venture capital was invested in female founders, an all-time high. But here's the bad news. That $3.3 billion that was invested in female founders, that is equal to less than 3%. 3% of all the venture capital that was invested in companies last year. And that was before we had a pandemic and a recession. Now, I'm sorry, now here's the really bad news. If we narrow that down to black female founders, do you know how much venture capital money they got? It's crazy. Over the past decade... Out of all the billions of dollars that have been invested, black female founders got 0.0006% of the money. Like, barely anything. Minuscule. But frankly, you don't need to hear all those statistics. I mean, if my 10-year-old knows that if someone is black or brown or female, that they're less likely to get investment money, you know it too. There are lots of reasons why, but let's just say that the systemic injustice that people have been protesting in the streets applies here, too. And now there are a lot of big companies and investment firms who are saying they are going to make their boards more diverse. They're going to hire more executives of color, and they're going to invest in more black businesses. But I am not going to list those corporations and investment firms right now, give them free PR, Because a lot of them are the same companies who've been pledging to increase the diversity of their workforce for years. 
and not much has changed. Anywho, the point is, who you know, where you come from, and what you look like, well, it matters a lot, especially in business. That brings us to this episode's profile. I'm Arlen Hamilton. I am the founder and managing partner of Backstage Capital, which is a boutique investment firm based in Los Angeles that invests in underestimated, underrepresented founders. So far, Arlen Hamilton and her team at Backstage have invested about $7 million in around 130 companies. So not a ton of money in the grand scheme of things. But these are entrepreneurs who might not get funding at all for their businesses if it weren't for Arlen. Just looking through the Backstage portfolio, the companies vary from solar energy startups to a hijab fashion brand and a meal delivery service. But the thing they all have in common? The founders are female or people of color or identify as LGBTQ. Arlen identifies as all three of those things. And she got her start by pitching Silicon Valley investors during the day while sleeping in the San Francisco airport at night. I'm from Texas and didn't go to college, didn't have any um, major connections in Silicon Valley, the place where, where venture and where startups, it's like the mecca for them. Didn't have any of that. But this episode isn't Arlen's Cinderella story, and it's not about how much or little she and her team can invest. It's more that, especially in light of all the protests about inequality and systemic racism, you need to know about Arlen Hamilton's thesis and her vision. Because I think we can actually apply it to more than just Silicon Valley or venture capital. But let's start there. So I have to ask you, Venture capital, I I was giving a talk to a bunch of extremely sharp high school women, girls, and I used the term VC, venture capital, and of course, one of them called me out and said, what is that? And I thought, you know, I live and breathe this stuff, but we need to define it. So let's say you were talking to this um, junior in high school. What would you say to her? Yeah, I would say think about the apps and products that you use today. If you watch Netflix, if your family has ever used Airbnb, if you've ever ordered food to be delivered on an app, a lot of them started as one or two people with an idea. And the ones that I mentioned uh, grew to be worth billions of dollars. There are thousands and thousands of people right now in the U.S. and all over the world who are building companies that um, they hope will be as impactful and as impressive and as uh, lucrative as as those companies. And in their quest to do so, many of them seek venture capital for, and the ones that do fit that mold where they want to grow really fast and they want to be a global company one day, Venture capital can be an uh, an interesting tool if used properly. I want to get into a lot of the things that you just brought up there. But coincidentally, uh, the young woman who asked me that question uh, was a young woman of color. And so mm-hmm. let's say she heard our description of venture capitalists and she was like, cool, I'll do that. Um, what? Any warnings for her? Because Arlen, <laughs> just for people who maybe have not heard of you, why are you so – unusual on the VC scene? Mm. Well, I identify as a black gay woman. I'm 39. And back in the day, which is only a few years ago, I couldn't find anyone who looked like me who was making investments in people who look like me. And the statistic, which unfortunately hasn't changed too much, has changed a little, though, which was which is promising, is that more than 90% of all venture funding is going to straight white men because of a lot of um, systematic issues. So five years ago, I'm looking into Silicon Valley. I'm looking into that world. I'm just as excited, too. I'm saying, oh, great, that's where you go. And then I realize, oh, wow, most of the power lies in a very few hands, and most of those hands are white. (laughs) And 
are they going to relate to me? Are they going to understand what I am working on or who I am as a person? Because a lot of these transactions, at the least at the beginning, start out very uh, relationship-driven and very much about a person getting along with another person. Now, of course, we can get along with anyone, no matter what our background is. But if you have the majority, overwhelming majority of the people who write the checks are straight white men who come also come from a very specific type of schooling or background or even way of thinking a lot of times, not all, but most, is that going to be fair? Are they going to look at opportunities in a fair manner? And so when I looked in and I, I, I asked myself that question, I thought, well, seems to me the solution here would be for more people who look like me to be able to write checks, which means more companies will have a chance of surviving and thriving, and maybe that will trickle down and that will be a catalyst for something really, really wonderful. And that's really where it started. There wasn't really anyone saying, like jumping up and down and screaming, this is terrible at the time. And I, I thought, well, I have a loud voice. Deceptively so, though. I find you have a very soothing voice as well. So (laughs) here's what I don't understand, though. Like, listening to you, I'm like, why VC, though? Like, why not say that you're going to change how philanthropy works or you're going to change who gets bank loans or you're going to change how tech accelerators work? Like, why venture capital? Why did you think that was the best way to get more women, minority, and LGBTQ people building businesses? I could see the writing on the wall. Like, I could see venture had been the catalyst for the companies that I mentioned earlier, had been from major companies that we were starting to really use on a day-to-day basis. And I could see, hey, the next 20 years are just going to be this explosive time for startups. And if we keep going the way we're going right now, a large group of people is going to be left out for no good reason. Maybe just because no one spoke up in this way. So my idea wasn't to go in and spend years and decades dismantling very strong institutions that have been around for hundreds of years. Banking, you know, I, it, I don't think I would have had the same effect in a lane that had such deep roots. But venture to me seemed like it was still in its infancy. Even though 70 years is a long time, it's very short time when you think about the bigger picture. And I thought okay, well, I cannot do this on my own. I don't have the capital to do this. There's just no way. I wish I were an angel investor or some sort of had some sort of family wealth, but I don't. So that wasn't going to be the case. I also thought, hey, you know, philanthropy is great, and a lot of people who I respect are philanthropic, but a lot of people are already working on that. And it seemed to me that a lot of the reasoning behind not backing underrepresented founders at the time was that these funders thought that we were a charity case. I I needed it to be something that completely turned that thought on its head. And it couldn't be sort of tapping at the door alongside several other people and saying, can we please, can we please have a little bit of the crumbs that you deem necessary for us. You've made fortunes. You have the ability to invest fortunes. Can we please have a little bit of whatever you carve out for your charity for the year? To me, that was not enough. We, as women, as people of color, as LGBTQ founders, and as others, we deserve just as much, just as much as anyone else. There's, there's, there's no line there for me. So you've been doing this, what, now five years, right? More than that? Seven years? I've been studying um, venture, startups, all of that since about 2012. And I got my first investor in the fall of 2015. And so how much money have you raised now? We've raised directly, or I've raised directly, uh, a little over $10 million, um, and and invested in more than 130 companies through that, and then have helped 
raise tens of millions of dollars for for our portfolio and beyond. So the sad state of affairs here in the United States, $10 million is actually, you know, drop in the bucket. not that much. It's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. When you got to Silicon Valley, did you know that a lot of this is just pure, sheer will, that it is a cult of personality, that you had to become basically a, a superstar um, for people to begin to give you money? Um, no, that wasn't what I, I mean, I call the the fund backstage capital. <laughs> I had every intention <laughs> of being behind the scenes. Um, and so, no, I didn't think that I would have to kind of create this brand in order to attract money. What I did understand, though, is that it would be difficult. It would be an uphill battle. I would have to explain myself every day, which I still do. Um, I understood that part. I understood the the grit of it all. What I also got, though, was I was studying different people's um, journey into venture and into just investing in general. And these different names of these mostly white men that I had read about or studied. And I thought, I can do that. Like, I thought, I mean, they're, they're great and all. They're interesting. Like who? Who are you thinking of? What I think about, I think about Chris Saka. I think about Brad Feld. I think about uh, Fred Wilson, um, Josh Koppelman. So many people who are kind of, you know, household names in the venture world, in, the, in this financial world. I thought each of them were really interesting. I, I want to learn as much as I can from their words. And that's what I did for several years. But I never thought, oh, I can't, I can't aspire to be like them. I just believe that I have um, I have a, a much higher risk appetite than most people I know. And I also have a, like this dogged determination that a lot of people could have done what I did, but they probably would have just stopped a quarter of the way because it was so, so difficult. So the extra part of now a lot of people know me and that only you know gets more and more every day or – expands more every day, that part I was not prepared for. Mm. So what I did understand, though, probably a year or so, right around a year or so into having the fund, so right around summer, fall of 2016, I started understanding. I would just sort of tweet out or I would write my feelings somewhere, and I would get very um, strong reactions to it. And I I always have in some way or another, you know. But what I started to understand and really has served me well is this idea that I need to have a very solid, strong voice, whether it's loud or soft. It needs to be solid and uh, have a foundation in something. And what I mean by that is that I need to have an opinion about things. I need to be, to stand firm and stand tall in my ideals and the things that I hold dear. And in doing so, that is when you attract what you want to attract. And you you will also really, really make some other people upset with you. But I'd much rather that what were they upset about though? Like what's the problem? Oh, I, with that? every day it's, it's still happens. I mean people think I'm too much or not enough. I have too much of an opinion about things. I I mean, I don't even know where to start because it's so much. A lot of it is based in um, my thesis around the fund being for underrepresented founders. So a lot of it has been people, obviously, again, the majority are all about it. But a lot of people have, have reached out to me privately or publicly and said that what I am doing is racist. What I am doing is discriminating against white men. This and that. You know, that has happened so much. I've been on planes where I've gotten into um, conversation, like strong conversations with white men who have, like more than once <laughs> in the last four years, who have said to me that they are the most oppressed group of people in the country and that what I am doing is part of the problem. And, you know, as ridiculous as You're it— part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as, a, as ridiculous as it may sound, which it does, sounds absolutely bonkers— they believe this and this, you know, we understand that there are millions of people who feel that way because of who our president is. So I um, I get that. I mean, I don't get, understand it, but I do receive that. What do you do when they say that? Like, do you start laughing? I laugh and point. Okay. I, I try to laugh and point first. I was wondering if you, like, stroke their hair or something. <laughs> I'm like, who hurt you? <laughs> um, 
no, to be to be honest, um, it depends. It depends on how it's delivered or and and where it is and all of that. And you kind of but most times I will listen and I will have the conversation and I just want to understand uh, so, well, this one time, this guy, he was a white man, and we were in New York, and we were in a coffee shop, and, and I was going to him for uh, trying to get investment, and this happens, you know, has happened thousands of times, where I'm trying to get an investment in a meeting, and he said, you know, I get investing in people of color because I can see clearly that there is a disconnect there with the amount of money they get. And I get LGBTQ because I can see clearly. But what about women? Why do you have women as as an underrepresented group that's being invested in? He said, in this country, women are treated fairly. And so I started looking around the coffee shop, and I said to him, what country do you think we're in right now? (laughs) Because maybe he was having like a fever dream or he was like an inception or something and I or I was an inception and I didn't know. I wanted to give him that that chance to explain to me what movie we were in where he thinks that women are treated fairly, equally, without fail. But he was so sincere because the few women that he's talked to or looked at, observed, seemed that way. He kind of looked around. And then I said, honestly, here's what we're going to do. I think I said, I think that we probably aren't going to have investment transaction right now because first what I want you to do is I want you to go ask five women friends of yours or colleagues, whatever, and I want you to ask them and say that they can be completely honest with you and just ask them this question this way. When was the last time you were treated unfairly because of, you were a woman? And if you promise to ask it that way, I guarantee you all five of them will have an answer for you. The question will be, was it this morning or was it a week ago? It won't be that it didn't happen. And so I I do try to have these conversations. What did he say to that? He kind of said, yeah, I'll I'll do that. And I think he was surprised that I didn't want to continue the investment conversation because he had all the leverage in that position. I mean, this was probably a good three and a half years ago, too. So I I had much less uh, traction. And, um, yeah, I I, I don't know if he ever did it. Um, My job isn't to go around and and fix everyone's broken ideas about life. But I can be, I mean, there's a lot of humor in, in all of that. Um, and I, it, it entertains me all day long. Keeps It's fuel for the soul. But I also can be kind of like, let me just, let me try. Let me, let me just try to get, let me try to see where you're coming from. My job isn't to go around and fix everyone's broken ideas about life. I gotta remember that one. Okay, quick break and then more with Arlen and why she never wants to see another cupcake delivery company again. Okay, so... In 2018, Arlen Hamilton, a black lesbian woman, was on the cover of Fast Company magazine. And that was a big deal. Did it change how Silicon Valley did business? Well, sort of, kind of. As Arlen likes to remind people, last year, one electric scooter startup got more funding in their last round than all the black women founders who received venture funding combined for the whole year. So you mentioned previously that um, venture capitalists typically have a thesis. Um, can you sort of describe what that is and what yours has been? And and then I want to ask you, you know, what the sort of markers of success were for your fund? Yeah, I mean, it has always been just around the idea that, uh, well, Black women specifically are the fastest growing demographic that are starting new companies. It's essentially about the fact that if we have done so much with so little so far, imagine what we can do when we're on a level playing field. And it's also around, I mean, if you go a little bit deeper, it's around just a few years ago, we have been saying this consistently. We've never changed this tune, but it, we were saying a lot of the founders who we call underrepresented, and we call them underestimated, a lot of those founders are very used to working under a pressure that 
people who are flush with capital aren't used to. And so when the market turns, these are the founders that you're going to want to have holding the capital that you've invested, at least some of them, because we're so used to dealing with so little and making it stretch. There are so many companies that I work with on a daily basis and for have worked with for years who for let's call it 1% of the capital that has been thrown into these other companies that are of the same ilk could probably have created something really special um, that were never either never given a chance or who are being overlooked right now, which is kind of exciting because they're going to be these um, underdogs that kind of catch you by surprise. So the companies that you've invested in, the portfolio, like what do they, how do you pick them? Because the deal with venture capital typically is that they want to return within three to five, maybe at most 10 years. And that the idea is to scale fast, go big or go home, basically. Are you playing that by those same rules? Um, I learn the rules. I understand the rules. Uh, a lot of our founders who we've invested in are playing by those rules, and some aren't. And I think that I think that it'll be really easy to decouple me from venture capital over the next couple of years. Not that I won't be working with venture capital. Not that I won't be utilizing it as a tool, as I have been since I started. But it is one shade of what backstage is and what I am. And I think that's... What do you mean? I mean, well, I mean that I've never been beholden to venture capital. I've never... I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to be a venture capitalist. It's always been a tool. Money has always been a tool. And things change so fast. These same people who have been knocking on the door, beating at the door now, saying we, we deserve equality and we deserve uh, equity and all of that, they're not necessarily sitting around waiting for venture capital to catch up to them. They're forging their own ways. And I think my job and the job of Backstage is to be available to our founders where they need us, to meet them where they need us. I think that if you look at Backstage in, let's call it two years, three years, you won't necessarily call it a venture capital firm. You might call it a firm that has venture capital as one of its tools. I haven't made a secret of that. I started talking about that in 2017, that I actually, I say that I want to create a new asset class. I don't know if it'll go that far, but what I do know is that I have no, um, there's no master here when it comes to, I have to color inside these certain lines, you know. Kind of my main day-to-day is either providing capital, going out and, and, and raising it a little bit at a time and deploying it as strategically as I can. A lot of it is in connections now, which I think ha- helps us punch above our weight. We may have only raised about $10 million or so, dollars, but we've been able to help connect people to at least 10 times that, at least 10 times. The biggest legacy will go back to, hey, I saw you on that cover, or I met one of um, Backstage's partners at this event, or I saw this video, heard this audio, and it made me believe that I could do something too. And now I did. You know, this is what I've uh, created. It's why I wrote the book. It's, it's, it's all, that's the legacy I think we have. I think a lot of the people listening to our podcast, they don't necessarily want to, well, sure, they want to be millionaires. That would be great. But, like, what they really want is they want to have a business or a job that they feel sustainable about, that it's going to support their family, that they can hold their head up high with the work that they do, that they can maybe actually save for retirement because Lord knows they don't have a 401k anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, the... the goals are actually far lower than all the fast company magazine covers would have us believe in some ways. Except for mine. Except for mine. Except for your cover, of course. Yes. You're right. There are there are a few, uh, you know, percentage points who really want to go for the gusto. They want to go for the moonshot is exactly how we started this conversation. They want to go for that. And for those founders or those entrepreneurs or those dreamers and doers, 
I'm here for you because I want to help you achieve that. And I want you to look great doing it. You know, I want you to to feel great doing it and, and be the best version of yourself doing it and not have to sacrifice all these things. Then there are those who are exactly what you just described. And to me, that is the foundation of what the country is. And I mean, small businesses and people with these these dreams, this is where I lived for so long, this kind of world of dreaming up things. And can I just get out of poverty? Can I just get out of poverty? Can I just get to zero? And then I can go anywhere. Those are my people. And so uh, that's why I'm able to speak to them because I get them. I don't know how many people recognize the names that I gave before, the Chris Saka, the Brad Feld, Josh Koppelman, Fred Wilson. I don't know how many people recognize all four of those names. But outside of venture, more and more people are understanding who different players are, who look like them, who are representative of them. And I don't wake up every day saying, how can I be a better venture capitalist today? I wake up every day and say, how can I catalyze my people? How can I get us all a seat at the table, help someone over here build a new table? How do I get people able to do the things that they want to do without having to worry about how they're going to eat the next day. And I think that it's all connected, right? I think that if you if you have more people of color who are catalyzed enough to have successful companies, no matter what the size is, then you have employment. You have more employment. You have more people with more equity. If you think about like the PayPal mafia and places where, the you know, Uber just had it where Their people just are flush with cash. That's how they're able to keep winning. That's how Elon Musk exists, you know, because they just keep feeding back into themselves. But a lot of these products that we're talking about that got a ton of VC money and grew extremely quickly and basically changed the fundamentals of how we live this century, they are very extractive in a lot of ways. They very much damage some of the people that you are trying to bring up in this world in terms of not giving them a proper living wage, not giving them insurance, not protecting them in a lot of these ways. So I guess what I'm wondering is, like, how much are you thinking about the sort of difference between high value and low value growth with your founders? Like, does it matter, like, how they're building these companies in terms of affecting everybody else on this planet? Yeah. I said I was in Milwaukee speaking and someone asked me what I look for in a company and a founder. And I get asked that all the time. And I said to them, I love the fact that I can have a cupcake delivered to me. I love it. But I don't need to see another cupcake delivery company, right? I want to see people who are changing their own lives by changing the lives of others. And... That, to me, is exciting. That's that's what's going to fuel me for the next several decades. We're constantly putting ourselves under a microscope at backstage because how can we go out there and talk about what other people in their houses are doing wrong and then we are failing miserably at something ourselves and not trying, at least trying to be better? I have been following with great interest the story of one of the companies that you invested in, which is a um, facial recognition uh, company called Kairos. And the story goes in the media that the founder uh, was edged out after he, uh, African-American man, was edged out after he insisted that that technology not be used by law enforcement because – As we know, very often facial recognition technology, as it stands right now, discriminates uh, against minorities disproportionately. It doesn't work on black faces a lot of the time. Yep. What's good for the company isn't necessarily good for humanity. I think, um, I mean, I I think we could probably talk about it for a long time because it is so nuanced. But the bottom line from my point of view is that I am at once, at all at the same time, capitalistic. Like, I am looking for returns. I want our portfolio to return to us. At the same time, I am also the one, the first one in the room, each and every time, that says we cannot sacrifice humanity, our humanity, for the dollar. I've slept on the floor, as you mentioned, of airports. I've not had places to live. I've not had food. 
that's not so so when you hand me, you know, but you also say you're not going to do it again. And like I've heard you also describe your purple velour tracksuit that you plan <laughs> on wearing in your penthouse. Oh, I'm going to so. be I'm going to be obnoxiously wealthy. Like there there's no question about that. I have I mean, just in what has changed in the last few years tells me that. It's it's almost clinical to me. It's almost clinical to me. <laughs> it really is. Like I I will I I have more money than I've ever had before because I've earned it. I will continue to earn it. I will the only thing that will stop me and I'm knocking wood, the only thing that'll stop me is me. If I lose track of everything that I'm saying is my are are my ideals, then I will go off path. But that's the only thing. I am focused. I will I will be a you know, you can pin it at 50 millionaire by the time I'm 50. To me, that's just a given. It's not even a question. I'd love to sort of wrap up our conversation talking about something that I have struggled with myself, which is if you in some ways are the product, and you are Arlen, you are the product, you are, there's a cult of personality around you in in the best way possible. But if you lose your path, as you say, how connected is that? to the business and what are the do you get like signs when things are going a little like wiggy wonky for you like what what do you know to look out for I just I I, I look internally all the time I always I mean and I do so and I do it very publicly (laughs) like I judge myself and I make sure that I am living by the credo that I espouse you know it's it's something that I think about all the time, and I think a great leader should do that all the time. I still have issues with figuring out how to lead a, a team because I'm so used to working by myself and letting, you know, trusting people to just be great at their jobs, and I think, you know, we're still working on that. I, I talk about that very openly. When it comes to other things, I'm almost 40, and I'm not um, easily swayed, so... And I, I went sober about two and a half years ago. All of that, um, I think, just kind of—and I'm just and I'm really boring, too. Like, I just—I stay close to home, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm just really a boring person. So if it's anything that's going to kind of rock the boat, it's probably going to be my opinion of something that, that affects, you know, politics or something like that. And, and I've, I've said to all of our founders, every one of them, I've said, if there's ever anything that I say that offends you— um, or that you feel is dangerous to your company, let's talk about it. But this is who I am, and I'm gonna I'm gonna back you as who you are, and, and I and I hope you'll do the same. Anything beyond that, I think we we all have a right to be ourselves, uh, and and I feel I feel proud of who I am. I feel proud of the decisions I make, and I try to be as honest about everything as possible. Arlen, thank you so, so much for giving us this time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, a little update for you. Arlen and Backstage Capital had planned on investing millions in another 32 companies this year, but with all the market turmoil, it's all on pause. However, Backstage Capital is experimenting with a crowdsourced fund to see if anyone really can join. I just applied to be an investor, and I will let you know if I get accepted. I clicked the box that listed how much I would be willing to invest, which was the smallest amount. But hey, you got to start somewhere, right? And really, my conclusion at the end of this interview was that Arlen's business is actually, well, I hate to say it, it's thought leadership. I really do hate that cheesy term, but I mean that in the best way. Arlen is a one-woman rallying cry, calling out the investment world and simply teaching people who don't have access to that rarefied world about how it all works, giving them a place to belong. If you want to learn more, get some inspiration. Arlen's book is called It's About Time. Her podcast is called Your First Million. And hey, if you can spare, like, big money, do consider investing in someone who doesn't look like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. You might just make yourself a tidy little pile of cash and increase the kind of companies that exist in the world to serve all kinds of people. Okay. 
Okay, so here's a riddle for you. What do you get when an Ivy League atheist chaplain has a come-to-Jesus moment about the tech world? It's not a riddle, actually. It's the next zigzag episode. These are the industries that are, are basically shaping what it means to be a human being. Chaplain Greg Epstein, I love him. How tech as a religion at big universities like Harvard and MIT needs to change. And how the chaplain had his own epiphany. Get this episode delivered directly to your ears by subscribing to ZigZag in whatever podcasting app you're listening to right now. Or you can have the episode delivered to your inbox with my newsletter, which also includes a note from me, the episode's gorgeous artwork, and links to articles that will flesh out the episode, give it more context. It's free and easy to sign up for the newsletter at zigzagpod.com. And I've got a quick question for you. What's going on with your life, with your work? I have heard about people who are deciding to leave their cities to take over a family business in another state or... Other folks have had to furlough their entire team and rethink the very basics of their business. Please share your story, what you're trying to do, how it's going. Record a voice memo on your phone. Email it to me at zigzag at stableg.com. This episode was made possible by the folks in my quarantine pod, including my daughter, Soraya. My brother, Armin Zamarodi, has been doing some audio work as well. Many thanks to them. It's a family affair these days. The rest of the team is remote and includes David Herman, Maria Wartal, Dan DeZula, and Matt Boynton. My gratitude to them and Jen Poyant, too, always. Special thanks also to my partners at TED, including Anna Phelan, Colin Helms, Michelle Quint, Will Hennessy, and Micah Eames. ZigZag is a member of the TED family of podcasts and comes from Stable Genius Productions. I'm Manoush Zamarodi, and thank you so much for listening. Hello. <laughs> what? What's hello? It's a business where you just say hello all day. You don't need any money to start it because you can just say hello right now? Yeah. Hello. Oh, it's like a free service. Yeah. Hello. Free service doesn't require any money to start the company. It just requires your time, though. How do you feel about that? Why not?